uh, a, a lot of fun, so please come. Next Sunday, we will observe Reformation Day. Uh, the choir has worked on a, a, a lot of beautiful pieces, a lot of beautiful hymns we'll be singing, and the Word and Sacraments, so uh, uh, please come, especially next Sunday. And then we have our Reformation Celebration Potluck then in the afternoon. There's a, a program that is scheduled. Should be a lot of fun, so uh, please, please come for that as well. We follow Divine Service 3 today, um, page 184. We serve, we serve the Lord's Supper today, a very holy and sacred meal of our Lord's true body and blood for the forgiveness of all our sins. Those who are one with us of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, are welcome and invited. Others, we like to teach the gospel first beforehand. We do have an adult instruction class on, uh, on Wednesday evenings. Our opening hymn is hymn 841. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father,
Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears. my people to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Fathers have told us Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. salvation when the righteous cry for help the Lord hears
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, of your bountiful goodness, keep from us all things that may hurt us, that we, being ready in both body and soul, may cheerfully accomplish whatever you would have us do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the 19th Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis chapter 28. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. O Lord, I call upon you, hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Amen. 
The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 4. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, Having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the ninth chapter. Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowds saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. Such are the words of Jesus today to a particular paralytic who was brought to Christ. And what great words they really are. For consider the fact that this man who hears these words, his life must have been full of all kinds of hardships. He probably could not work at all because of his ailment. It is very likely that he would have had to rely almost exclusively on family and friends for even the most basic necessities of life. Realistically, about the only thing he could probably do to try and help would be seeking alms through begging. Life for this person must have been terribly difficult. And I imagine rather discouraging and disheartening, which is what makes the words of Jesus even more meaningful. He looks at this person and tells him before anything else, take heart. This man who by all accounts had every worldly reason to be downcast and distraught is encouraged to be courageous and not to lose heart. What the paralytic and his friends have come to find in Jesus, Jesus is more than willing to give. Because they have come, as our text says, in faith. Which is to say, they know and believe who Jesus is and for what reason he has come. Christ is right to bid this man to be courageous and strong. Because what Jesus brings is what this man really needs. Not riches power or faith, but the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. To show that these things belong to the paralytic, Jesus calls him his son or his child. And to be the child of Jesus means to be an heir of all that he has. For just as earthly parents will so often leave all that they have to their children, so much greater does Jesus leave what he possesses to his heirs. And while Christ does not possess the riches of the world, he most certainly is in possession of the treasure of heaven. This man who lay there helpless and hopeless in the eyes of the world has just been named an heir of heaven itself. And so Jesus plainly says to him what is true for all the heirs of heaven. Your sins are forgiven. And those sins have to be forgiven. Otherwise, the paralytic would not be a true child of Jesus. But since he is, forgiveness must be his as well. Because there will only be those who are both sinless and righteous in heaven. And this paralytic has received by faith what he came to get from Jesus forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. And notice that while many others in the Gospels beg of Jesus to heal them of various ailments, there is no record that this is the case for the paralytic. Certainly he probably desired to be healed, but he has come in faith. And with the words of Jesus that he has heard, he has received more than any mere healing of his body will ever bring. And he can depart from Christ, courageous, just as Jesus bid him to do. Because the fullness of what Christ has come to bestow upon man, he has now received by the word of God. All these truths, however, do not sit well with everyone who was there. Our gospel lesson records that some of the scribes think within themselves that Jesus is blaspheming. They look on this scene and they cannot believe what they have just seen with their eyes and heard with their ears. Here is a man stricken with an illness, rendering him unclean and probably reduced to begging. He doesn't look like someone who deserves much of God's blessings. But rather, as if he is someone who has already received God's curses as evidenced in the hardships he faces. Theirs is an all too typical kind of works righteousness. They think that people have to earn something from God. And this man has nothing to give. 
Not only that, but they are astounded to hear Jesus say that he forgives this man his sins. Who can proclaim such a thing? Only God can do this. And yet, here Jesus stands as one who proclaims the forgiveness of sins with such divine authority. In their estimation, Jesus is making himself out to be God, which is why they think he is blasphemed. They despise Jesus for this. And they also despise the paralytic and so many others like him who have received such a great blessing from Christ without any merit or worthiness in them. Needless to say, what is in the hearts of the scribes does not sit well with Jesus. He is displeased with their disposition toward him and presumably toward the paralytic. So Jesus calls them out saying, why do you think evil in your hearts? But notice, when Jesus does this, he is calling them out for something no one else can see. Only God looks into the hearts of other people. You and I cannot simply look at someone and know what they are thinking. We might be able to take a good educated guess sometimes. But that is not what Jesus does. He tells them with certainty what is in their hearts. And it is evil. It is evil for two reasons. On the one hand, like the Pharisees, and in fact all evil people, they think they can merit things from God. And someone like this paralytic in their minds couldn't possibly deserve anything because his life doesn't reflect what they consider to be a good life under God. He has too much suffering and poverty for that. Something like the forgiveness of sins would be too great for a sinner like him. Likewise, they do not believe that Jesus is the Christ. They have not come in faith to hear and see Jesus like the paralytic has. They think he is blaspheming when he tells the paralytic that his sins are forgiven. Because Jesus does not teach the kind of works righteousness they want to hear. He teaches faith in God. And therefore faith in himself. And all that he has come to do for sinners as the true way to receive the gifts of God. To reveal to them that he really is God in the flesh. And that God's good gifts cannot be merited by works. He challenges the scribes. He challenges them. Asking them which is easier. Saying your sins are forgiven. Or rise and walk. Obviously at least to the eyes it is harder to say rise and walk. Because if you say it and the paralytic does not walk. Everyone will know you are a liar. But if you say your sins are forgiven, no one's going to be able to tell whether that's actually happened or not. Because it's only going to be fully and finally revealed at the consummation on the day of judgment. To prove who he is. And that he has the power to freely forgive sins. Jesus says, rise, pick up your bed and go home. That is exactly what the paralytic does. And for our part, what we have to recognize is that there is a part of us, the old Adam, that will always want to commit the exact same errors as the scribes, especially when it comes to how we merit God's good gifts. We will want to believe that God's gifts of forgiveness and eternal life are something that can be merited. And I know we have all heard that we are justified by grace through faith alone so many times that we kind of think to ourselves, it is preposterous that we could fall into the same error as the scribes. But it's true. We like to make judgments about ourselves and others, particularly whether we are and other people are good based on what we do. And we don't simply do it with our words. We especially do this when it comes to our hearts, just like the scribes. No one can tell what we are thinking about anyone else. But if we are honest with ourselves, our hearts are not filled with the love of Christ for others. We are the ones who are quick to blame others 
when they run into troubles in life. We make judgments about why people's lives are the way they are, particularly if they're difficult. And we do this without knowledge of all the facts or without the kind of mercy that God wants us to have on others. And yet when good things happen to us, there is this very strong inclination to think that we deserve these good things from God and that God must be pleased with us because of our hard work and our efforts and all the things that we do. And only if everyone else were like us, things would go well for them. They too could be blessed. But none of this is true. There are no good people who deserve good things from God, including us. Whatever good we have received in this life is but a free gift of God. Because all sinful people deserve nothing from God but His temporal and eternal punishment. And the lives of other people, whether they have much worldly good in this life or not, is no real indication of their standing before God. What really matters is what is in their own heart. If they, like the paralytic, have faith in Christ, then they really are a child of God. Despite the outward appearances to the contrary, at least as our sinful eyes count appearances. This fact that the good gifts of God are given, not as the result of our works, is of the greatest good news for us. Because if the gifts of God of the forgiveness of sins and eternal life were the result of our works, there would be no hope for us. Because our works really are like filthy rags before our Heavenly Father. And they are just thrown away and disposed of. Yet as we can clearly see today, Jesus welcomes us to himself, knowing that we have nothing to give in return. This is most certainly the case for the paralytic, and it is also the case for us. Our Lord wants to have mercy on us poor, miserable sinners. He has come into this world for this very purpose. And he hasn't just come bearing some gifts, but the best ones. Our Lord Jesus Christ comes bearing good news that you and I are to have courage in this veil of tears. That despite any evils that may confront us or the difficulties and burdens we may bear, yet we do not have to be discouraged, hopeless, and downcast. Because the end of our life is not going to be estimated on our health, wealth, and happiness. It will be determined on the mercy of God. And our God is gracious and merciful without end. And for this reason, He has made us His children by baptism. Jesus, just as the paralytic, has become the inheritor of heaven without anything to offer God as payment therein, so have we become the inheritors of the same kingdom simply because God has loved us in Jesus Christ. By faith alone, without any merit or worthiness in us, just like the paralytic. We who have been brought to Christ also receive the same words that the paralytic once heard. Your sins are forgiven. Every evil thought of our heart, every word of ours contrary to God's word, and every deed worked from the father of lies at our hand has been washed away. And before the sight of our heavenly father, all that remains to be judged is the righteousness of Christ we have inherited. And so this day, we may depart in peace with the same joy that the paralytic received. Because there is no greater gift God can give us and the gift of his own son, to whom we have been called, and before whom we shall stand for all eternity. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.
Almighty God, through the sacrificial death of your Son upon the cross, you atoned for the sins of the whole world, and in him you reconciled the world to yourself, not counting our trespasses against us. Receive our humble thanks for this precious gift of salvation by which you comfort us in the forgiveness of sins. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you give your Son, Jesus, the authority on earth to forgive sins. Grant that we may always rejoice to receive this forgiveness in your church. Through your gospel and sacraments, keep us faithful in receiving your gifts, that by your grace we may cling to you in faith unto life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy. O Holy Spirit, bless the teaching of your word to our catechumens, that they may increase in the faith and understand more of your grace and mercy, that they may always rejoice in your new life in Christ through baptism, and that they may forever continue in your family. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, grant your blessing to Roy Askins and Micah Wildauer as they serve as missionaries within your kingdom. Guide, protect, and uphold them Grant that all who hear your word may receive the gift of salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of the church, bless Jacob, Stephen, and David as they prepare to serve within your kingdom. Give them sound training in your word and a caring heart for the needs of your people. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord God, grant your blessing to Michael and Sarah who were married yesterday. Assist them always in your grace, that with true fidelity and steadfast love, they may honor and keep their marriage vows, grow in love toward you and for each other. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, hear our prayer on behalf of the young adults in our congregation who attend college or who are employed. Protect and guide them. Let your word dwell richly in them. Nurture the faith given them in baptism and strengthen them by your holy supper. Grant them wisdom to discern what is false and to hold on to what is true. Lord, in your mercy. O God, giver of all good gifts, we thank you for the birth of a son entrusted to Brianna Bieber. Send your holy angels to shield him. Preserve him according to your good pleasure and bring him to the saving waters of holy baptism. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, look down from above. Behold, visit, and help your servants, Colette and Pam, for whom we pray. Look upon them with the eyes of your mercy and give them comfort and sure confidence in you. Defend them from every danger to body and soul and keep them in peace and safety. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our God, make us ready to receive the most holy body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of all our sins, and grant us grateful hearts that we may give thanks to you. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection open to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed 
come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and when he had given thanks and he gave it to them saying, Drink of it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> the peace of the Lord be with you always.
thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. O oh God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in the sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.